Grace and peace, beloved of God, and welcome to Morning Star Connect. This is our Bible study for Women's History Month on Daughters of the Dust, Wisdom of the Wisdom of Women. Let us open up in prayer. Oh, gracious and precious Savior. Lord, we just thank you for another day along the journey. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, we ask that you would open our eyes to be able to see deeper into your word, that we would be able to see our lives reflected in your word, Lord, that we would see solutions for our challenges reflected in your word. Lord, give us a heart of compassion for all those that cross our path. Strengthen our hands, O oh Lord, to do the work that you're calling us to do. It is my prayer this evening, Lord, that you would be glorified and magnified and all that is said and done will bring you glory, that a soul would be encouraged, another soul would be saved, another life would be transformed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Again, welcome, beloved of God. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I greet you on behalf of our senior pastor, the regular Dr. Beverly D. Frazier. Again, we're here with Daughters of the Dust, the whispers of wise women and today's focus will be the wisdom of weeping women. So tonight we will look at women who weep. We're going to go through scriptures on weeping women from Jeremiah 9, 10 through 20, Jeremiah 31, 15, Matthew 2, 17 to 18, Luke 23, 26 to 31. And then we will look at specific women. We will look at Hagar, Rachel, Hannah, an unnamed woman in Luke, and the widows of Joppa. Now, you may be saying to yourself, now, Reverend Sister Kathy, why are we looking at weeping women? Well, first of all, in the Bible, there's over 53 references in the NIV version to weeping. There's 97 references that scriptures in terms of weep. There's 85 scriptures on crying out. There's 42 scriptures on tears. So within the Holy Scriptures, there's over 458, close to 460 references to crying, references to weeping, references to crying out to the Lord, to weeping. And I think that as we live in this, what some are calling post-pandemic, I still think we're in the pandemic, but as we're living in this uh, 21st century, um, I think that particularly women of color, um, particularly black women, um, that we are raised in thinking that we should not cry, that crying tears are for the weak, you know, I don't know about in your household, but in my household, where they didn't worry about Dyfus when I was growing up, if you were crying, they said, now nah, I'll give you something to cry about. And that wasn't a discussion, if you know what I'm saying. Um, or when you lose someone and um, you're going to the funeral, you know, I, who in my teenage years had to bury both the only man I knew as a father, who was my stepfather, and uh, bury my mother, who I loved dearly, um, but, you know, the adults around me wanted me to be stoic, uh, did not want me to cry. They didn't understand the scripture says that weeping may endure for the night, but joy come in the morning. And so weeping in our tears, I think we need to embrace them so that we can get to healthiness, we can get to wellness, we can be more emotionally connected to our bodies, to our spirit, uh, to the walk that we have in this life. Jesus said, in this life, we would have tribulation, but be of good cheer. <laughs> he has overcome this world. Jesus was tested in the same ways we're tested. And we know that Jesus wept. So tonight, we're going to go through the scriptures dealing with uh, what the word is saying. We're not going to go through all 460, praise the Lord. Uh, but we will. Let's just review a few. And we're going to look at a few women and their circumstances. In Jeremiah 9, verses 10 through 14, the word of God reads as thus, For the mountains will I take up a weeping and wailing, and for the habitation of the wilderness a lamentation, 
because they are burnt up so that none can pass through them. Neither can men hear the voice of the cattle, both the fowl of the heavens and the beast are fled, they are gone. I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitation. Who is the wise man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it for what the Lord well, for what the land perish and is burnt up like a wilderness that none may pass through and the Lord said because they have forsaken my law which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice neither walk therein but have walked after the imagination of their own heart and after Balaam which their fathers taught them let's continue in scripture therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, even this people with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the heathen, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider ye and call for the mourning women that they may come and send for the cunning women that they may come and let me just do a footnote right in here the mourning women there is a tradition within uh, the jewish faith about the mourning women women who come uh indeed when there is death when they are preparing uh to go to bury a beloved one uh there's the mourning women and that continues continues even unto um, this day and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may run down with tears and our e eyelids gush out with waters for a, wail, a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we spoiled? We are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land because our dwellings have cast us out. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth and teach your daughters wailing and every one of her neighbor lamentation. Lord have mercy. Now, uh, if we could just go back for a minute to the previous slide. Here, right here in verse 20. Hear, yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth and teach your daughters wailing and every one of her neighbor lamentation. We know that Jeremiah is considered the weeping prophet. Um, but here God is saying, you know, we need to teach our daughters to cry, to cry out, particularly when there's so much going on. I mean, today, tonight's not a study in Jeremiah, but we know that indeed he had to be the prophet uh, to talk about uh, what was going on, to tear down, root out what was going wrong in the particular community in which he was prophesying to. And if truth be told, if we look around in our own circumstances, if we look around in the cities where we dwell, if we look around even in the rural areas, if we look around not only at you, you, Ukraine, but look around all the world. Yes, uh, there is sword, there is trouble. And indeed, there needs to be weeping. We need to be weeping over how the land itself uh, we have not taken care of. Weeping on how so many have turned away from their calling in Christ, turned away from the teachings of God, turned away from worshiping God in spirit and in truth. We need to weep and call out because there are those that go to church for form and fashion. There are those who go to church to be seen. There are those who go to church to make a connection, hoping that they'll be able to get the next big gig. There are those who go to church for all reasons. Some go for a country club. Some go for just a neighborhood club. Some go because they want to feel important. Ah, but we're called to go to church to worship God in spirit and in truth. We're called to go ahead and weep over the situation that we find our nation in. We're to have, we're to weep and call out to God, make a call at midnight and worship God. Let's go to the next slide. Jeremiah 31 verse 15, thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were no more. We know that the children of Israel were taken 
into slavery in Babylon. And we know that as we who are here in the United States, our ancestors uh, who were dragged here from the motherland, weeping for our children. We know that there are children, no matter what your background is, whether you're white, black, Latino, Asian American, we're losing our children uh, to drug abuse. We're losing our children to fentanyl. We're losing our children to the streets. We're losing our children because this pandemic has placed them in in a place that we've never been before and they've never been before. We have more young people committing suicide than ever before. We need to be weeping like Rachel. And we cannot be comforted because our children are taking their lives in many different ways, weeping. Let us go to the next slide. We see that the prophecy of Jeremiah is then also stated again in the book of Matthew. And in the book of Matthew, the second chapter, it says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentations and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are no more. Now, in this section of Matthew, this is the section that we go over at Christmas time as we celebrate the birth of Christ. But just as there was the celebration of birth of Christ, because Herod was such an evil king, because Herod uh, was threatened by Christ, who the prophecy said would be king, he put out an edict for all children two years old and under to be slaughtered. There was a slaughtering of children. And I hate to inform you, beloved of God, but there's still a slaughtering of children that's occurring all across this world. We know that in Ukraine, that there are several hundred thousand children that are orphans. We know that in Syria, there were children who were destroyed and killed and made orphans. We know that in Afghanistan, there were children that were made offerings and killed and all kinds of other atrocities. We know that indeed from the Mexican borders, there are children that are coming by themselves, children that we worry about whether or not they've been putting in sex trafficking. We need to be weeping because our children are no more. No more can children be children. No more weeping. We need to be on our knees and seeking God for his divine intervention right here and right now. Our next slide, Hagar. I wanna to talk to you for a minute about Hagar and you can read about Hagar on your own time in Genesis the 16th chapter verses 1 to 15 and Genesis 21 verses 1 to 13. But to give you the two minute summary, Hagar, no go back to Hagar please, Hagar was battered she was rejected and scorned, yet she was seen by God and she named God. Now Hagar um, became the slave, uh, amen, to Abraham and to Sarah. And uh, Sarah uh, decided of her own accord to hand Hagar over uh, to Abram so that he could produce an heir because at that time, Sarah was barren. And Sarah, although they had the promise of the Lord, Sarah did what we do as people, and dare I not say as women. Well, I won't speak for you, I'll speak for myself. I, too many times in my life, had tried to take things into my own hands under the delusion that I was helping God. God didn't need my help, and what did I do? Make a mess of things, and God had to clean it up, and indeed, this was a mess. Hagar was a slave from Egypt. She did not have control over her own body. Uh, her mistress, Sarah, became mean to her. And so she goes into the wilderness. And although it does not say specifically that she shed tears, although it does not say specifically that she was weeping, we need to just use our common sense, my sisters and brothers that are watching this. If you are battered, if you are rejected, if you are scorned, if you don't have the right to your own body, but somebody else thinks they have the right to control your body or violate your body, you are going to be crying. You're going to be weeping. 
And it may have been that she had to be like our ancestors. I think that's part of our generational trauma, our ancestral trauma, because you couldn't cry. That's why I think we were raised saying don't cry, because we couldn't cry out for fear that there'd be more of the things that would come from the slave master. But here, here is Hagar, and she's out there, and the Lord speaks to her. The Lord knows her situation. And Hagar, as we said in another lesson, Hagar is the first person to name God. She said, you are the God who sees me. She was seen by God. Isn't that what we all want? We want to be seen. We want to be seen when we're in a downward spiral. We want to see, be seen when it is the worst of times. We want to be seen in the best of times. We want to be seen. Beloved of God, know that God sees you right now. He is the God who sees you, sees you in your circumstance, sees you on the job, sees you looking for a job, sees you as you're trying to make the best of your life right here and right now, sees you as you're working, working, working so hard. God sees you. He sees you. And we need to embrace that we are seen, even when we are battered. Not that God has called us to be a rug to be beaten, find a safe place my sisters, even when we're rejected, so many receive rejection, indeed, because of the color of their skin, because they're African American, Latino, Asian, rejected because you're smart, rejected because of the skill set that you bring, rejected because you speak truth to power and scorn, scorn because you choose to still worship God, scorn because you're still uh, doing what thus saith the Lord, scorn because you trust in the scriptures, scorn because you're walking by faith and not by sight. God sees you and God has called you to be light and to be salt. Oh, praise God. Even in rejection, we are seen by God. Next slide. Rachel. Rachel names her son Benoni, my sorrow son. And that's in Genesis 35, 16 to 20. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Ra Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not. Thou shalt also have this, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, that is the son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, that is the son of my right hand. And Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Here's Rachel. When you read all about her life, you see that she was the beloved wife, indeed, of Jacob. He worked first seven years for her, then another seven years, because uh, Rachel's dad pulled an old bait and switch and had him uh, have to marry her, other, her, her sister. Uh, but he loved this woman. And Rachel had her issues, as we all have issues. You know, she, she somewhat pitted one son against another because, again, she felt she was going to help God out in that situation. You can read that scripture for yourself. But she was the beloved wife of Jacob. And here she knew that she had this son. And in those days, in that tradition, in that agricultural context at that time. Having sons were blessing because it was the sons who would go out and have to, you know, help with the agriculture. It was the sons who would be charged with taking care of their mothers uh, once the father had passed away. Sons were held in high esteem while daughters more often than not were not lesson for another day. But the point here is to know that Rachel in her weeping, in her giving birth, ah, she named her son the power of naming, son of her sorrow. But his dad, he named him Benjamin, the son of the right hand, which means that indeed 
Rachel was his right hand. And he viewed the son as taking that place of love in his heart that his wife had. Ooh, praise be to God to be loved that way. Our next slide. Hannah, prayers of a weeping woman. So we're going to go through 1 Samuel. This first one is from 1 Samuel verse 1 to 5. Now there was a certain man of Mathesaphim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanai, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elohu, the son of Tuhu, the son of Zeph, and Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peniah. And Peniah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Echonai offered, he gave to Peniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sorely to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple, and she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sorely. Now before we move on, I'm sorry, go back. Before we move on, in verse 6, and her adversary also provoked her sorely to make her fret. Here it's because the Lord had shut up her womb. I don't know about you, my sisters and brothers. Ah, but I've been in situations and circumstances where the adversary seeks to provoke me sorely to try to make me fret. But the scriptures tell us to fret not because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. We need to understand that there are enemies of our soul. The word teaches us we fret not, we, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. The adversary comes to seek, to steal, kill, and destroy. Ah, but indeed, Hannah, even in the bitterness of her soul in verse 10, even as she fretted, she prayed unto the Lord and wept solely. I believe in the power of prayer. Whatever you're going through, if there is a place of bitterness, uh, we're taught don't let any bitterness take root, but we are called to pray unto the Lord and we can weep unto the Lord. Next slide. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaiden and remember me and not forget thy handmaiden, but will give unto thine handmaiden a man child, then I will give unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass that she prayed before the Lord. He Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put thy wine away from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful heart, a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Amen. Isn't that just what happens? People want to mistake when you're trying to seek the Lord for something else. Continue to seek God. She poured out her soul unto the Lord. And again, she didn't, she prayed in her heart. She didn't raise her voice. That's another challenge of this 21st century for us. For so long, for 21 centuries and all those before, the voice of women 
People have attempted to silence. They attempt to use scripture to silence us. They attempt to use legislation to silence us. They attempt to use position to silence us. No, God hears our heart and we need to go ahead and raise our voice unto the Lord and cry out to him. And so in verse 16, count not thy handmaiden as daughter of Bilal. But out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken here too. Out of the abundance of her complaint and grief. See, it's all right to go ahead and pour out to the Lord. I always say, God, God knows who we are. God knows how we think. God knows how we feel. Amen. And it's better that we just have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our sorrows. Yes, we need to sit down and 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 meet with Christ face to face. Let him know what we're going through so that we can move from the weeping that endures from a night to be able to get to the joy of the morning. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thy handmaiden find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her countenance was no more. Go in peace. This is what we need to be to tell others. Go in peace. May the Lord answer your prayer. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Therefore, it came to pass that when the time had come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bore a son and called his name Samuel, that is, ask of God, saying, because I have asked of him, the Lord. Oh, praise be to God for this example. Now, there are times when indeed we can pour out our heart before the Lord. And although we may want a specific thing, God may say no. And we need to praise God even through that no. We need to praise God when he closes the door and thank him when he opens the door. I know many times there have been doors that were closed and it took me a while to fully appreciate. Thank you, Lord, for shutting that door. Thank you, Lord, for taking me down another path. Thank you, Lord, for interceding. Amen. We thank God that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And as Pastor Beverly says, we need to stop thinking we're smarter than God. Amen. Next slide. The unnamed woman of tears. This is in Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 37 to 39. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anoint them with and and anointed them with the ointment now when the pharisees who had bidden him saw it he spoke with them himself and said this man if he were a prophet he would have known what manner of woman this is who touched him for she is a sinner oh how quick how quick are people to label women sinners? Oh, how quick people are quick to turn and twist words. Lord knows that I wept as I watched the Supreme Court confirmation hearing for Justice Kentonje Brown Jackson. Oh, how they tried to accuse her of so many things. But she, like Jesus, stood there and didn't say a mumbling word. She, like Jesus, stood there and lived out loud my Angela, Maya Angelou's poem, and still I rise. She bore all those fiery darts and flames and lies that came from the pit of hell. People who wanted to misrepresent her character, people who wanted to misrepresent her, her record in terms of sentencing, people who wanted to misrepresent her. Oh my goodness gracious, even though they supported non-minorities who had the same voting record, even though one particular person, uh, a particular senator, has his child in a school that practices anti-racism. Lord have mercy. The hypocrisy. Why are we not surprised? Spiritual wickedness in high places. And let us bring our prayers together for this judge. 
that she will be elevated to the Supreme Court and that God will keep a hedge of protection around her as she makes history as the first black woman uh, to seat, to have a seat at the Supreme Court. Oh Lord, we trust you that your answer will be yea to our prayer. And so here we have a woman who took her alabaster box. If you never heard it, please go and, and Google uh, Cece Wine and Song, My Alabaster Box, because she talks in there, you don't know the cost of my oil. We don't know the cost of the oil. We know that Judas was upset because he wanted to take the, the oil and use it to pay for, other th uh, pay for other things. And here we know the Pharisees are up there being judgmental about this woman. When you read further in the scripture in Luke, you will see that Jesus asked the question, you know, if somebody has a debt and has a great debt, um, who is the, has a small debt, someone else has a greater debt, who, uh, has paid the greater price. And so the Pharisees said, well, he who was forgiven of the, of the greater debt. Huh? And so here, this woman who has been forgiven of her sins, amen, her sins that the community acknowledged, <laughs> her sins that, uh, uh, I'm not here to preach tonight, but anyway, they saw her as a sinful woman, but did they count their own sins? But she went to his feet weeping. My brothers and my sisters, and particularly my sisters, we can go to the feet of Jesus and weep. He will take our tears. We can anoint him with our prayers. We can lift up his name. And Jesus sees us. Jesus hears us. Amen. Give. Pastor Beverly preached on this two weeks ago. Go look on the website as he has the journey to the cross. Be encouraged. We need to give the best of our service. We need to give the best of what we have to Christ. Give from our alabaster box. Next, the widows of Joppa. And Acts 9, 36 to 41. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which interpreted it's called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass that in those days that she was sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in the upper chamber. And inasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent unto him two men, desiring him that he should not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went to them. And when he had come, they brought unto him brought him into the upper chamber and all the widows stood by him weeping. You see that? All the widows stood by him weeping, showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was yet with them. Here their tears are tears of a testimony. Their tears about their dear friend who had worked so hard. Their dear friend who had just was a woman who served. But Peter put them all out and kneeled down and prayed. And he turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And calling in the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Praise God for the brothers that understood what this woman, Tabitha, that she was important to the community. Praise God for the women that stood as witnesses weeping. And now their tears, which were mourning, have turned into gladness because Tabitha was lifted up and he presented her alive. Oh, how God is calling you and me to be able to lift up those in the community that people would think are dead, but they're not dead, that people would want to throw away. Let us reach out to those people in our community that are in the highways of hedges of life and let us call out their names and tell them to rise up out the muck and mire. Let us be like Tabitha and give back to the community and help people to rise up to take their hands and help them and lift them so that we can present them alive, worthy of the Lamb of God, worthy to be saved, worthy of the love of Christ. Lord, have mercy. Yea, Lord, the widows of Joppa. And so, beloved, 
as we go to the next slide. What are the lessons that we learn from these weeping women? First, Hagar teaches that God sees us and we have the power to name. Be careful how you use your power for the scriptures tell us life and death is in the power of the tongue. Use your power to speak life, speak over yourself, speak over your family, speak over your circumstances. Rachel teaches us that in our sorrows, we are still blessed and much beloved even unto death. Oh my goodness, to have her husband name her son, son of my right hand, oh Lord have mercy. Hannah teaches us there is power and provision through our tearful prayers. It's all right to cry out to the Lord. The unnamed woman teaches us that our tears are a cleansing palate that Jesus receives. That's the woman with the alabaster box. She cried. Her tears were used to wash Jesus' feet. And you got to think about that for a moment, my sisters, that Jesus was walking through the streets of Jerusalem and through the mountains and through the valleys. Oh, my goodness. But she used her tears and her hair to wash his feet and then to anoint them. Jesus receives our tears and we need to let go and let God and allow our tears to cleanse our soul, allow our tears uh, to cleanse places of our pain, allow our tears to release our emotions, <coughs> both tears of sadness, but also tears of joy. Let our tears be a cleansing palate. The widows of Joppa teaches us that our tears can celebrate our friends and their contributions, even as they face death. And we all know that Jesus wept. Thus, so can we be encouraged in your tears. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that weeping may endure for a night, but that joy comes in the morning. Lord, we thank you that you've blessed us with the capacity to cry. And Lord, we affirm for women this day and for men that it's all right to cry. It's all right to shed our tears. It's all right to pray to you through our tears. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers. Lord, we thank you that you see us. Lord, we thank you that you hear us. Lord, we thank you that you made divine provision for us through the saving grace and the life of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you sent Christ to earth, Lord. We thank you for his great sacrifice and that on the third day he's raised from the dead and he sits on your right hand side right now. We thank you for the great sacrifice of his life as he was bruised for our iniquity and our transgressions. Lord, we thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for cleansing tears. We thank you that we can seek you morning, noon and night. Oh, Heavenly Father, it is our prayer that we will learn the lessons from these weeping women. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we weep for what's going on in homes, in our community, in our country, in this world, we seek your divine intervention. But it's not like we are people without hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We trust you, oh God, to even turn these things around. We trust you, oh God, to teach us, to guide us, to lead us, and to wipe away every tear. For we know when you call us to heaven, there'll be no more tears. In Jesus' name, I submit this prayer. Whatever I have failed to ask for, please fail not to grant. Amen. Amen. Oh, beloved of God, be encouraged. Uh, indeed, uh, please go to our website where we have several different ways that you can donate to Morningstar Church. And here they are up on the slide. There are five different ways. If you're a person who zells, you can give through Zell. Uh, if you're a person that likes to text your donation, we have text to give. If you want to give the five, you can find Morningstar Church. If you're a PayPal person, you can find on the payee info at welcometomorningstar.org. Or you can go to our website where there you're able to give. So please if indeed these Bible studies have been a blessing to you, if God puts it on your heart, please, please, please uh, give. Give of the best that you have. On behalf of the Reverend Dr. Beverly D. Frazier, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I hope this has blessed somebody uh, along the way. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. May the Lord lift up his countenance in Jesus' name. Remember, Jesus has called you to be the light. Jesus said that you are the salt. Let your light so shine, twinkle, twinkle, so they can see you, superstar. Indeed, and let your love, let your love, let your love uh, of Christ show to all who come across your path. Remember, you are the beloved of God. Walk knowing you are his beloved and go ahead and love someone else along the way. I love you. Blessings now.